when you're only selling in those times, yeah. I think you get a superficial sense of your skills. When you have to sell in the hard, tough times, when you don't know when your next meal's coming or whatever that saying is, that's when you really have to be gritty, be creative. And that's what makes me excited because I know at the end of this, we're going to have really talented professionals that gave it their all. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do. But how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of B2B EQ. Today's guest came highly recommended as a sales leader from Matt Green, one of our previous guests. She got her start in sales selling cookies door to door with the Girl Scouts, close to my heart and something we'll have to talk about. Her specialty is revamping sales teams to work smarter, not harder. And over the past 17 years, she spent her time launching new verticals, overseeing go-to-market strategy, and redefining the way companies operate. Head of Sales Enablement at LoadSmart, Stephanie Benavides. Stephanie, great to have you on. Thank you, Tim. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this is a fun discussion. So we want to get into the Girl Scouts eventually because I have had a, a, a want to always get Girl Scouts involved in digital sales for Girl Scout cookie selling. And I want to get the inside track. We've got to figure this out. I see a, a campaign in the future of a, an entire troop of Girl Scouts getting on the phone, putting together sequences, running a whole inside sales team, taking over the cookie wars. Well, I mean, I may have you beat a little bit already because as a troop leader, uh -huh. um, I actually make my daughters pitch their cookie pitch to me digitally. I record it. They have to come up with the whole creative idea. Like you can't just walk up to someone and say, would you like to buy some cookies? You got to figure out a way that's, you know, the FOMO, the, the pain, something, right? And so I have been uh, successfully recording their pitches and I place it in our Slack channel at work and, you know, let the magic happen. Uh, we also distribute it on Facebook to our family and friends. And, you know, I wouldn't be a good sales leader if I didn't make my own children do that sort of a thing. I love hearing that because one, it's, it's an awesome product, right? Hey, the product, the product sells speaks for itself, right? It sells itself. Yes, but but not very differentiated across grocery stores you go to, family, friend that reaches out. So really being a good seller is key in this market. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to differentiate. And I think some of that goes into a little bit of EQ you're teaching these girls. I would like to think so. I think one of the most important attributes I'm trying to teach these girls is you know, being different is okay. Being unique is okay. And one of my favorite experiences with this whole sales pitch cookie thing was they came up with a little song. And so I've actually had sellers in this market today pitch me with a rap song, which I was like, this is pretty cool. Okay. You've got my attention. I'll, I'll bite. All right. What do you, what, where do you want to go with this? So being different in the marketplace is absolutely crucial. You can't send 20 vanilla emails to someone and expect me to bite. It's mm -hmm. just not going to work. I, you and me both probably receive hundreds of DMs, emails, emails, et cetera. Get my attention doing something else. It's, it's not going to work with a, a van I keep calling it a vanilla cadence, but. That's a good way to say it, right? Like vanilla ice cream, they always say, hey, that's good. It's, it's in every, everything. Consistent. But yes. Yeah. We love consistency, but I like creativity. I like uh, that shiny new object that's out there that's going to potentially garner my attention. It's You just hit the word on the head. It's attention, right? And one of the mm -hmm. things, so I've, I've gotten the opportunity to not only talk to a lot of sales leaders on this podcast, but we did a survey of over a thousand B2B buyers and sellers. And so the, the results are just starting to come back in and we're mm -hmm. analyzing some things. You know, it goes down to relationships. It comes back to kind of the core things that are human. Um, 
personal connection, yes. feeling heard and understood. And the one human superpower that seems to really cut through the noise more than anything is like what you said, it's creativity. And I think in today's market, more than ever, you know, we talk about AI and you know, chat GPT, I think is on the minds of every single person. The elephant's always in the room of like, oh, how are we going to use this? Or what, what did I do new on that? How do we use it to potentially for good versus yeah. like taking our jobs, right? Yeah. Or, or, or for just unleashing the spam cannons on us because now right. writing an email is, is like two prompts away from pretty good, consistent email. But again, it gets sure. into the vanilla. It doesn't break through the right. noise. Right. So I take all that into consideration. I'm going to start off with a question we ask everybody, okay. but I'm going to phrase it a little different. What's the one soft skill that's not only creating an impact on relationships and revenue, but that's also cutting through the noise? Mm, that's a great question. What is one soft skill mm -hmm. that will cut through the noise right now? Yeah. I mean, I, huh. I think that it's just being unique, right? Doing different things in the market, but, mm -hmm. um, I was prepared for you to ask me a different question. That's why you caught me off guard a little bit. Oh, gosh. I had to put a turn on it. But I think, I think what we talked about last time, which was around the idea of curiosity, I think gets us there, right? Yes. And, and you had some great takes on curiosity and how putting that into practice, like really, truly can make a difference in not only your outbound strategy, but then also in like deal management. Take us through how you instill that curiosity in your teams. Absolutely. So I think curiosity is one of Lord, Load Smart's core values. Mm -hmm. And so it's just part of our DNA as an employee. And we're really trying to distill it as just one of the major skill competencies for our sellers. You know, thinking about the end result in mind, where are you trying to go? and then map backwards, right? So what are you trying to solve for? Let's start there and then let's work backwards. So if the end goal is to um, create an automated way to understand how your loads are booked, moving, tracking, tracing, all of the different things, and you wanna understand when your drivers are in the lane and see visibility to that. So, what are you doing at the end of the day? Well, you're saving them time and energy to get them out of spreadsheets. You're automating it in a way for them to see it in real time with these geo mapping, tracking, I mean, this mm. magic. And so at the end of the day, that's what you're selling. You're not selling a, um, this is for one of our products, but you're not mm. selling just this widget that tracks people and checks them in you tell them what you're helping them with, right? So you offer that up and you have to lead them to that place by asking the right question, being curious as to what is their day-to-day? -day, what is their pain that they feel every day? How many hours are they spent checking their emails? How many emails are in their inbox? Are there thousands? Well, gosh, that sounds inundating and overwhelming and wow. We could save you so much time and energy of your email inbox by using this platform because everything is done for you. Ta-da, we've gotten you there. But you don't know those things without being curious and asking some of those very simple things like your day-to-day, -day, the volume, the time and hours spent meticulously combing through these things, mm -hmm. right? Without asking those questions. It's like anything, you know, producing a podcast, there are friction points in producing a podcast that if somebody found out, hey, you're doing this and asked me, I'd probably be pretty open to saying, yeah, here's the places where, you know, it, it gets a little friction filled or it's tough. Sure. We all have, Editing? I'm kidding. We all have that in our day-to-day -day process. It's a lot different than saying, okay, Stephanie, so what CRM are you on? Oh, okay, Stephanie, sounds great. So how many people are on your sales team? Oh, that's awesome. So, like those are self-serving questions for me. Right. What you're bringing up is like, ask the questions about them, start with the user and then work your way back to the solution right. the product. I love that you're saying that because when you ask the question of, well, what would make your day better? 
right? Like, mm-hmm. you're, oh, you're spending that many hours on your email. Oh, if that's going to make your day better, if that's going to make you a happier employee and more successful at what you're doing, then I have a solution that can help that. Right. Now it matters to them. Right. And so I think that curiosity, you, you hit it on the head. Like that is, it's so key in every part of the sales process because we go straight into, I got your attention. Now let me tell you a demo. Right. Now let me tell you a story about something. And I may not even have that issue. Well, and creating the story is absolutely key, right? Mm-hmm. So many times I see sellers do their demos feature function, feature function without some sort of a, make up a story. Like you don't like put yourself in their shoes. You've, you've learned all those different points I just called out. Now build a story around that. Build your demo as part of that story. All right, John, I understand that you are spending X, Y, Z hours doing this, 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 and this. Here's how this solution would help you. I'm going to outline what this does for you. And boom, you've done it. Yeah. It could be very simple. It doesn't need to be this, you know, choose your own adventure book. Of, right. And then we're going to skip to page 75 and talk to you about this. No, he doesn't care about that yet. You can get to that at some other point, maybe in a vidyard or a follow up or case study. You don't need to sell every feature, function, product thing in your first call. I, I It happens so often, right? Like, I get, let me get through these points. And it's like today we only schedule things in 30 minute sound bites. And by the time you jump on, actually acknowledge somebody's presence, get to know them a little bit, talk to them. Mm-hmm. We really have maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Well, and to your point about the timing perspective, I'd love to talk about that for a minute because yeah. when people book an hour discovery or an hour demo, I'm going to say demo call. Commitment. I just panic because they're going to use every minute in that 60 minutes to show me every feature. Mm-hmm. I think best practice is, I'm not even going to say 30, I'm going to say 40, 40 minutes, 30 minutes to show the solution and keep it an open conversation. Not again, just like talking at them. Mm-hmm. But getting the buy-in, asking them along the way if this is what you know you were expecting, anticipating, would this help? Getting confirmation along the way, essentially, and then mm-hmm. leaving the last ten minutes for truly kind of any outstanding things that we did not discuss today that you're still curious about. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good. Sixty point. minutes is too long. <laughs> Stop yeah. doing it, everyone. <laughs> Why? Well, I even like there. There's something about somebody showing me a solution, me being able to absorb it. And then say, hey, Tim, when you want me to show you something else we can do, let me know. Yeah. Because then it's like, I'll, I'll come back in 15 minute sound bites. I'll come back in, in little small discussions once I can mm-hmm. kind of see something coming to life for me. But when I get the whole solution, you know, it's like sitting down, you've got an all you can eat buffet. You're like, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to solve for. <laughs> like, yeah, this all sounds great. Right. But now distill it down for me because again, we're like eating a whale here. I don't know where to start. Now you've overwhelmed me and I'm in this state of overwhelm and I'm going to need to take a step back and think about it. And I'm not as excited anymore because it seems overwhelming. And that's what you don't want to do is overwhelm your buyer with too many bells and whistles that now they're going to put you on the back burner. 100%. Indecision is way easier than feeling confident and trying to tackle any of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so question, how do you coach that? How do you teach that? You're in a sales enablement role, load smart. But how does that kind of framework and then how do you monitor that over time with your sellers? I think there's a lot of coaching that happens on the floor. We definitely try to get in front of that. We take the cue from leaders. Um, I used to have sales coaches on my team. I don't any longer right now. but mm-hmm. As a small but mighty team, trying to everyone jumping in and rolling up our sleeves, we are working with the managers to coach our managers to better do that. And then we will also get involved to help kind of build that muscle with our sellers. So we actually ran some sessions this week about active listening and how it will lead to better discovery. So um, even just simple, I don't want to call them mock scenarios, like with our product, but just like doing some fun activities that are kind of off the wall and improvish and other things that I think start to like get 
I want to say get the pistons going, but honestly, thinking outside the box for that learning opportunity. So that's some of the things that we're doing internally to kind of build that muscle, uh, the coaching on the floor, coaching the managers, and then providing some of those skill building workshops for the teams with fun and different ways to think outside the box when asking some of those key questions. I like that. There was a recent article, um, Seth from Forrester, Seth Mars, okay. and it was analyzing a seller and looking at them as like a high performance athlete. Now, mm. I happen to be putting some presentations together that kind of followed that trend for an event we're doing. But um, so it, it just resonated for me. But it was interesting because when you look at that, one of the things that we all do in sport that we kind of make fun of or don't take as seriously in business is the improv, right? You practice every day. When I played soccer, rugby, it was like you showed up five days a week and you were practicing, you're improv for the game. Mm-hmm. Very rarely do we do that in, in sales. And then game footage was the other one, right? Like actually- Oh, the highlight I, reel, yeah. Like my nieces, they're you know in their early teens, high school. They've got cameras up there now watching every single one of their soccer games. And one of the questions I had was like, do they get to review their game film? Some do, some don't. But I think so many revenue teams today don't realize how much like game film and data they're actually building that they could go back on and look or coach to kind of like a sports team. Have you ever thought about it that way? And and is that something that's been on the horizon or, or things you've seen? Absolutely. I'm a big, big Believer in the game film. I do think that there's different tools out there. I'm sure I could name them, but I won't name drop. But there's there's plenty of tools out there that can help coaches, managers, sales and development professionals to identify key trends so that maybe there is an obvious glaring area for training that maybe might need to happen as a group, but also individualized um, areas for improvement, areas to just, you know, commend them on. And I think socializing those good, bad, and ugly examples are absolutely key. You know, no, as uh, one of my favorite Peloton instructors says, no ego, amigo. Honestly, (laughs) we're all in this together. We're all doing the same job. And if we can learn from from one another, why not? Spot on. Uh, Well said. And so I'll piggyback off that. In a time when watching your own game footage and, and film, like analyzing what you're doing is more prevalent than ever. It's starting to become really part of a sales culture, mm-hmm. some organizations. Where does EQ play into the, the collaboration, the creativity, the, the curiosity, some of these different factors? How do you see it playing in and, and what do you focus on in like your hiring and, and your development teams? Like, yeah. how does that all pull together? Well, you you touched on a few things there, and I'm going to land kind of on the the back end of that question first. So there's a key project that I'm working on right now, uh, interviewing, shadowing, and building out success profiles for our recruiting team based on our high-performing cohort of one of our sales teams. So I had the opportunity to, like I said, interview, shadow, and really just get into the weeds with these people on... uh, a weekly basis for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. And I wrote up an executive summary for our leadership based on the data that I found. There was a lot of great things that I found out and some interesting areas that I'm like, wow, this is our high performing team. And okay, well, there's even some work to be done to make sure that they are doing the best that they can do. Yep. This makes me nervous to do with this for our middle and low performing cohorts, but Got to start somewhere. Yeah. So based on that, it was interesting to understand what makes these individuals motivated, what gets them out of bed every day, how do they approach their jobs, uh, and just what does success look like for them? And, you know, I kind of distilled all this information and it was super, super intriguing to know that not every single person had similar attributes, which was kind of telling them like, well, how do I build a success profile for these people? You know, how do we measure 
um, emotional intelligence or what gets people motivated. Sometimes it's an intrinsic motivation. Sometimes it's an extrinsic motivator for people. Um, but doing a blend of these things together is what is really going to make these people successful in their roles, mm -hmm. successful in um, their professions. And I think that that's one way that we really need to dig in in the interview process. But I also am a big believer in using some of those tools out there that will mm -hmm. measure some of those things for you in a, a very um, executive summary type way. But uh, yeah, I, I can dig into some of the different details if you want me to. Uh, yeah, I'm really curious. So self-motivation comes out. That makes sense. I have to, if I'm a seller, I have to be self-motivated. Now, whether mm -hmm. intrinsic, intrinsic or extrinsic, I would be really curious in the performance there and also in the longevity right? Like mm -hmm. times get tough when things are harder to sell. Like, does that make a difference whether you're intrinsic or extrinsic? And if someone's listening to this and goes, I have a hypothesis, or if you do, I really want to know, but what are some of the other factors? What were some of the differences? Because mm -hmm. like what you hit on is that you have to be a diverse team, which makes yep. sense because you have a diverse buying group. But then what were some of the common themes that, that you saw across all these top performers? Um, a lot of them were former athletes. Okay. And so they already kind of had that sports team mentality, mm -hmm. uh, ingrained to them. I would say a lot of them had, um, their own family kind of, um, either first generation, Hey, I went to college or, Hey, this is, I moved out of my small town in XYZ part of the world. I'm here in the big city of Chicago and I'm going to make it and I'm going to make something for my family. And so that was really interesting, kind of that first generation mentality. Yeah. Um, competition obviously is one, but grit and passion, I think also routine and consistency. So learning about like every day, how do you approach your day was one of my questions. And mm -hmm. I would say four out of the six people had very established routines they would wake up at 4.30 in the morning, go to the gym, that they would read every night before they went to bed, that mm -hmm. there was some sort of self-development that they were doing outside of work, that they were doing on a daily basis. And to me, it's small habits like that. They mm -hmm. really create a very high IQ person, not IQ, EQ, high mm -hmm. EQ person, because you are building all these other small habits that give you a sense of um, accomplishment, a sense of routine, stability, and then have respect for others then who also do similar things. So I think of it as more of a, um, with May being Mental Health Awareness Month, more of self-care than yeah. anything, really. It was, they take care of themselves to be better individuals in their professions. And what you're hinting to is, is a lot of self-awareness. So what we find in, in yes. EQ side, just on the science of EQ, is that self-awareness is the foundational piece. Like first it's self-awareness, then it's social awareness. Then you can start to really self-regulate, right? And really kind of know, hey, slow down or speed up or put more tone in your voice. Mm hmm there, you, you can't get to that next stage, right? It's kind of like Pavlov's hierarchy. So right. I think what you're identifying is that cornerstone of EQ and that's in that self-awareness. Like if I know what I need to be a top performer every day, then I've got to get up and go to the gym or I got to do those things. And I think that is, that is a critical component. And really interesting that that shows up in the real world, not just in the, you know, Hey, the books we read sometimes. I was going to say, not just in the books that are kind of claiming these things. <laughs> uh-huh. Absolutely. So I'm curious, as an enablement leader, I'm going to change the topic a little bit here. How does sales and marketing work together for you? And where do you see yourself in that mix? Great question. Um, internally, we actually had some reorganization recently where now our marketing team is under the sales arm. So our chief customer officer is overseeing all the sales efforts and marketing, which I think is wow. going to bring a lot of great alignment. Um, it just kind of took place within the last month. Mm -hmm. So I don't have superb findings to share at this point in time, but I do think that it will bring 
a greater level of collaboration when creating campaigns, creating assets that work, creating things that aren't in a vacuum in marketing. I think sometimes marketing gets charged with a lot, right? And they don't often bring it back to sales to say, is this working? You know, we've gone and created this beautiful campaign, but is it working? Is it resonating in the market? We may have some downloads and this and this and this, but is it working in your sales process? Yeah. I have no idea. Um, today, I can't answer that because we don't have some of those tools and or insights to provide, but I'm looking forward to the day that we can. It's true. I mean, I think anytime you put a new message or a new piece of content out into the wild, everybody's looking at it and thinking, well, yeah, it looks good. Let's see how it actually performs, right? And you have to be right. able to test it. That is a gap today. Like there's there's challenges. And I think there's, I know there's technologies that are starting to do that. Um, mm -hmm. but, and we've been working with teams with AI in order to kind of get the context of like how someone's reactions to a piece of content can be. But it's it's a fascinating ask because I think that is sometimes where the friction points are. Mm-hmm. And that collaboration takes like time, effort, and energy. I was on an executive forum the other day. One of the gentlemen said, yep, we sit down as an account team and we plan out that account. Like we literally sit down and talk through every single thing across marketing and sales and whoever be involved with that big account and get the lowdown on everything around it. And then we go to market that way. But that takes two, three, four hours, multiple sessions, time. Nobody has right. much time. It doesn't scale. So how, how do you kind of um, find ways to keep that collaboration going? What's worked? I don't even know if I can answer that yet today, Tim, no. honestly. That's okay. I, I think it's a challenge out there. And I think collaboration is one of those. So I'm going to continue in this, in this um, podcast is like asking revenue leaders. And hopefully I can mm -hmm. back to you and to our listeners. It's like, what is that? And I don't think it's a one size fits all, right? I'm not asking yeah. for the perfect silver bullet. But that collaboration piece you call out is is a really big need in the market right now. Yeah. And I, not that I don't want to answer the question. I just think that because this is a new motion with having this team be part of the customer journey now, yeah, they've done a wonderful job of outlining our personas. What are their pain points? The, the persona journeys. Those things are taught to us, right? But are we really sitting down, as you mentioned, to say, all right, XYZ customer, we're using them here, but we've got seven other teams that aren't entrenched with them. How do we make it more sticky, right? Mm -hmm. To have two, three, four products under this one account. How are we cross-selling? And if it's this kind of a industry, let's replicate that and go to other companies like that and replicate that model for them. That's what I don't, I don't think we're doing that today. And maybe they can prove me wrong if this is included as part of the conversation. But um, that that is an area of opportunity that I believe needs to happen. So maybe we can talk in like six to nine months and uh, maybe it'll be different. <laughs> there you go. Well, and, and we should, because I think a lot of companies are going through this process because right now it goes back to that attention. Like you're talking about, how do I cross sell? I already have this person's attention, this company. Mm -hmm. How do I get stickier and keep that account? In today's just environment, I think there's a lot more opportunity for growth there. And it's a lot harder to get out to a new account. So a lot of people are focused that way. So um, yeah. hopefully in a few months time, we do get to report back and have some great solutions. Yes. So what excites you about the future? What are what are some innovations, some things you're seeing in the industry that um, get you excited for, for where things are going? I think, you know, where we are today, the market, um, it's bleak, right? Most people are nervous because the market is kind of on the lower end, right? It's, there's a lot of dissonance in the market, Um but what excites me is that I know that there's a silver lining at the end of this you know, tunnel. If you've been working for as long as I have and you have, I can assume this is cyclical. This happens, you know, and ebbs and flows happen. But what makes me excited is I think 
going through these tough and challenging times will make stronger, more resilient, grittier sales professionals because they've had to go through this tough time. If you were always riding high when the hog, whatever that saying is, when the- High on the hog? Thank you. I was like, I knew I'm going to screw that up. (laughs) You were good. Yep. Um, I feel like my dad with his jokes, like telling the punchline before actually getting the the point. (laughs) When you're only selling in those times, I think you get a superficial sense of your skills. When you have to sell in the hard, tough times, when you don't know when your next meal's coming or whatever that saying is, that's when you really have to be gritty, Mm -hmm. be creative. And that's what makes me excited because I know at the end of this, we're going to have really talented professionals that gave it their all. They didn't coast. They didn't just cash it in. They didn't just sit there and warm seat. They actually went to work and did the thing. Um, But, you know, that is also kind of the thinning of the herds, right? You have to prove your value. Sales is a performance and numbers game. And look, if you don't start to evaluate your pipeline and get into the weeds even more Mm -hmm. um, than you did before, then unfortunately, I think that some people have experienced um, layoffs and and other things. I'm not going to generalize. I know that there's a lot of talented people on the market that were not in that position, but for people who have coasted and just kind of rested on their laurels a little bit, then yeah, the time is now to get to work and get gritty. Yeah. I like that. I like the grit because I think it takes grit to get close to your customer. It takes grit to to day in and day out, kind of stick it out to really understand like what, what's going on in that account? How do I break through? How do I add value? How can I help this person and and stay with them? Because getting getting the no, getting the ah, next quarter, like that, yeah. that runs and now is a, a tough time. So that self-motivation and that high IQ, high EQ, you got me going on too, that high EQ is going to make a big difference. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, so Stephanie, I've had the opportunity for the last 30 minutes in our audience to learn from you, but I want to learn a little bit more about you. So tell me a little bit about the team you manage right now, your company that you're working at, and uh, just kind of take me back, you know, give me, give me a little, uh, little history on Stephanie. Sure. So I'm obviously, you mentioned at the beginning of the program, yep. out of sales enablement at LoadSmart. So I was brought in to build out the department to professionalize um, from the moment that a seller enters the door at LoadSmart from onboarding to everboarding. It didn't exist, right? It was a in-person two-week seller's, I'm going to call it nightmare because it was a classroom environment for eight Mm -hmm. hours a day. And there was no no differentiation to how people were learning. It was all, as I lovingly called it, Julie, the cruise director, standing at the front of the the room, talking through a PowerPoint. That was it. There was um, there were some exercises and things embedded in the process, but it stopped there. And then people went on their merry way to the to the floor, to their managers, and that was the involvement of sales enablement. Well, I quickly realized that ain't going to work because um, one, not everyone learns that way. And 80% of what they just learned, they're going to forget by day 15. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to be a deer in headlights, not knowing how to approach their their job. And they're going to, you know, either sink or swim by surrounding themselves with others that maybe all right, I have a buddy that I can rely on. So I realized quickly, we need to set up some sort of a way where on-demand learning is available for people, that people could jump into different key components because we have 10 different selling teams. They all sell very differently and they all have different sales cycles and they all use different tools. And I could continue going, but literally it was, a lot of identification of where do we fix first, right? Um, I also mentioned those classroom trainings were only happening for two of those 10 teams. Oh, wow. So we weren't even influencing all the sellers that were coming in the door. 
And I was shocked to learn that, wait, so we haven't talked to this team over here. They have no idea what XYZ is. Okay. So, I mean, I built out this charter, presented it to our CEO and our chief customer officer and said, look, I'm going to need to build a team to scale and meet the needs, whether it's people, platform, or processes. I need a marriage of all three so that we can best support all of these sellers, which at the time was about 350 people. And today we're scrappy and lean. Um, I don't have as big of a team as I did before, but we are now the three musketeers trying to meet the needs of these sellers. And we're doing a bit of everything. We're doing onboarding. We're doing coaching. We're doing ongoing skill and training boot camps. We're helping to leverage the different tools and systems to better make them more proficient and productive. Um, And we're part of product rollouts now, which was not something that was happening. We, yeah, they would roll out products and didn't have sales enablement involved in training. Um, So that was another area of opportunity that we could influence. You know, a new product goes to market. We should probably train people on how to pitch it correctly. We should probably train people on, you know, how to demo this Mm -hmm. and no, not that, you know, product marketing and product didn't do a fine job, but I think sales enablement's involvement was absolutely key in some of those different go-to-market strategies. So we're evolving. um, And I think my team will evolve as uh, time goes on, but it makes me excited for the future. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited for sales enablement. I think ops and enablement, those two parts of the, the revenue team right now are more critical and more of a competitive advantage than ever before. I, I would I agree. Really do. Right now is where you need to double down on training and retaining the teams that you have to make them the most productive and efficient that you can. Taking your foot off the gas pedal right now, I think does a big disservice to organizations. Yeah. And I think where a lot of companies are trying to go up market or they're trying to, you know, get into bigger accounts because they, they see the, the eye on the prize to, to maybe expand there. It's going to take more of a SEAL Team 6 approach than like having the infantry. I just, and so I love the way you're approaching it. I love how you're, you're, you're taking it. I like the, what is it? Everboarding. I'm going to use that, that term. Yes. <laughs> I thought that was great. Um, Stephanie, this has been a lot of fun. So Tell me a little bit about, I just, so everybody knows your company kind of knows mm-hmm. the space you're in and who you're selling to. Tell me a little bit about what your, what your company's doing. Sure. So Load Smart is, we're calling it a digital disruptor. We are um, in the logistics and transportation space. So we often are selling to shippers and warehouses. Um, we have a traditional brokerage team that is actually moving your stuff from point A to point B. And then we're selling to enterprise level clients that potentially are using some of our digital products. We're also committed, um, you know, shipping and doing their managed transportation on a monthly basis. Um, but we're doing things differently. And that's why we are calling ourselves a uh, disruptor. I love it. Well, if anybody is in that industry and listening, please talk to Stephanie, learn a little bit about more, their, little, learn a little bit more about their company and, and check them out. Stephanie, the question I ask everyone, take yourself back, you're graduating college. What <laughs> piece of advice you'd tell yourself? I know you've got, is it one girl, two girls? Two girls. Two girls, right? So they're going to listen to this at some point. What's the advice? Yeah. If I could go back right after graduation from college, I would not have, I would say, slept on the ongoing education aspect of my life. I think I didn't really kind of start to re-engage with ongoing training and education until a boss was like, you know, I really think that you would benefit from reading this book and, you know, going to this three-day class. And I'm like, yeah, do we do that still? Do like people actually go to these different events and learn something? He's like, yeah. Um, And so I think I've always been a consummate learner. I've always loved learning. But I never felt like I had time. I always felt like I was doing, 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 but that I couldn't take the time to go take that webinar, go to that different conference or event. And I always kind of thought of them as silly, but actually going 
I was kind of re-inspired. So I would have told myself, hey, don't wait seven years to potentially like re-engage in ongoing education, training, professional development. Um, it also afforded me a lot more networking capabilities. Networking always scared the crap out of me. So I remember being part of this, um, I think it was a LinkedIn group, but maybe it'd still be um, young professionals in Chicago or something. And I remember these things taking place at, it's actually at nightclubs, um, but it was like right after work. So you would go to these things, it would be a happy hour and networking. And they scared the actual crap out of me because I didn't love going into a room of nobody, knowing nobody yep. and essentially it being like, all right, hi, I'm Stephanie. This is what I'm looking to do. This is what I do. So I actually would tell my form, my younger self, uh, who cares? Yeah. These people might actually see you in the future and these people might not see you in the future. But if you started doing those things Years ago, maybe it would have gotten you to a different place a lot sooner. And so while no one loves to work a room, mm -hmm. it might there might be some benefit to it. So suck it up, buttercup, and go network. Hey, good advice. I think great advice and timely because of, number one, we've all been gone for a few years of this stuff, right? I mean, it doesn't matter who you are at this point. We're all starting back again and doing a lot more in person and face-to-face -face or getting back into these communities. So what a great opportunity to jump off and start to anyone listening right now. Um, we'll put even in the comments of this show notes, some of the ones. And if Stephanie, if you have any communities in Chicago that you think people sure. should be part of, give those a shout out. We'll put those in the comments as well. Um, the other side of that is this continued learning. Mm -hmm. Great insight because right now the pace of change is so, so fast. With all okay. the things that are coming out, I think every single person, right? I don't care what job it is. What do they say? And, and I, I truly believe this. It's like AI or, or the innovations we have coming in for us is mm -hmm. going to take our jobs if not by AI itself, but by people using AI, right? Right. As a marketer, is going to be better if I'm a marketer and I'm leveraging those mm -hmm. tools. You in sales enablement or in sales, whatever it might be. It's a lot of ways to optimize what we're doing. So 100%. Huge opportunity there. Well, Stephanie, this has been such a fun discussion. I can't wait to have you back on, hear all about these changes that are going on and also hear about all your findings in the next few months. For all of our listeners out there, where can they find you? Where can they connect? Absolutely. You can find me on LinkedIn. It's very easy. I believe it's just linkedin.com backslash S. M. Benavidez, so Stephanie Benavidez, mm -hmm. and I would be more than happy to continue the conversation, whether you want to dig into some of the things I spoke about today, or you just want to shoot the breeze and learn some other things, I would love to connect. Perfect. Or if you want to get the competitive intelligence on Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> that too. Yes. Major differentiator in the market here. If you're not video marketing with Girl Scout cookies, I don't know what you're doing. Stephanie, Thank you so much for joining me on this episode. It's been a blast. A lot of fun. Thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. Yes. To our audience, to all of our listeners, catch us wherever you listen to podcasts. And until next time, have a good time selling. Take care. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.